Welcome back to the lab. We just walked through exactly how Seth, our 3D printer thermal runaway monitor works. We talked through how this design helps to prevent any 3D printer in the world from burning down your house or your shop in the event of an uncontrolled thermal runaway condition. Yeah, this project is awesome. I love this thing, but there's a little bit of trickiness as well. Um, yeah, you see, you may have noticed that there's no reset button on this thermal runaway monitor. That's because it's designed such that a power must be removed and reapplied to the thermal monitor to reset it. The benefit is that we don't need to worry about the reset button failing such that the device no longer functions correctly, but the consequence is that we need to think very carefully about how this design is going to power on. We better make sure that Seth always powers on into the not tripped state, because if it doesn't, Seth would be literally useless. The power on transient, the transition from zero volts to five volts on the five volt rail is what resets Seth. And therefore how specifically this rising edge happens, how this transition from zero volts to five volts happens while Seth is powering on ends up being one of the most critical design elements for this device. That might sound like an easy thing, but it's not as simple as you might think. There are a few issues that can occur when powering on, and a few specific issues that we've added to our design due to decisions that were made. Let's start with those general issues, because power on can introduce a lot of glitchiness in any system, both because there's a time where every component has an invalid voltage applied to it, something outside of its normal operating range, but also while our circuit is unsure about its life and its place in the world, we're also capacitively coupling energy into every net through parasitic circuit elements built right into the very copper shapes on every circuit board, every PCB. Yikes. If the right amount of energy finds its way into the right pin of a comparator, logic device, microcontroller, or switch from power supply controller, a phenomenon known as latch up can occur. Now, a circuit that latches up due to power on transients probably wasn't designed very well. Either that or it's very complex or has very high voltage involved, but maybe, you know, a component isn't behaving in accordance with its data sheet. Eh, I wouldn't say it's a bad design outright. There's a lot of reasons why latch up can occur during power on transients. It's just something that could and does happen sometimes. Startup weirdness is a big reason why devices like power on reset monitors exist. Sometimes a good reset pulse after a power on transient can just bring a microcontroller back into an own good state if it went out to lunch during power on. Another issue that happens pretty often is back driving higher voltage rails with lower voltages. Now let's pretend that our five volt rail isn't derived from 12 volts for a moment. In a design like this, the five volt rail being powered on might hold the 12 volt power supply at five volts for an extended period of time when it's meant to be powered down. That's not always an issue, but if a system has many, many, many power supplies, off might not really be totally off and circuits generally don't like being held at invalid voltage levels. They don't like being held at supply voltages they weren't designed for. And they especially don't like being held in that state for extended periods of time. That will lead to undetermined performance of the system, potentially damage. Sometimes invalid power states, which is what we just described, can be established through parasitic or unconsidered diodes in components like ICs, which typically have clamping diodes pointed to both VCC and ground. These diodes help to protect a device against transients like EFT and ESD, but they can also provide unintended current pads if not appropriately considered. Put 0.7 volts across a diode in the forward direction and, well, current's going to move. It's a diode. Now, that's enough general conceptual dreaming. If you've got questions about specific power on glitches you've seen in the field or in the shop, drop a comment on this video. Let's spark some discussion and knowledge sharing below. After all, I can't possibly list off every glitch you might ever experience in a circuit. Those were just a couple examples. I'm trying to make a point that power on transients, power on, power down sequencing, and considering how a circuit will respond having some of its voltage rails disabled is not trivial and is very important. There are a lot of issues that can and do occur from skipping these analyses. Hopefully that isn't foreshadowing. Oh. At least I hope that isn't foreshadowing. God, get off my back, transients! <laughs> Anyways, our temperature monitor design. Seth! 
So, remember that whole thing about comparators that latch themselves stuck on forever to disable power to the 3D printer semi-permanently? Yeah, that's a thing. These comparators compare the OK felt net to 2.5 volts. The 2.5 volt rail, 2V5, will be ramping from 0 to VCC over 2 in a way that looks like an RC time constant, where the R is approximately 12 kilo ohms and the C is approximately 2.2 microfarads. This will be approximately exponential. Meanwhile, the OK felt net will... Oh my! Looks like some jerk made a capacitive voltage divider with an RC time constant to follow... Wow, that's neat. Difficult to analyze, but neat. Okay, so at t equals zero with ideal component values and no leakage paths, there's zero volts on OK felt. If the five volt rail instantly snaps up to five volts, then the voltage applied to OK felt will be five volts multiplied by 6.6 .6 divided by 7.6 .6 or 4.34 volts. As time progresses, this net will be pulled up to 5 volts through an effective resistance of 33.7 kilo ohms, and maybe, just maybe, if there are glitches in those comparators until a valid supply voltage is established, OK filled pulled down to ground while the comparators power on. Ugh, that's scary. The most critical thing is that the comparators pulling down on the OK felt net can't discharge those capacitors holding up OK felt below that exponential charging curve before the comparators finish powering on. We need to make sure that there is enough bulk capacitance here to keep the circuit behaving. I'm sure you're following along, right? Oh, oh, you'd like to see some waveforms? Of course. My pleasure. Check out this LT Spice simulation that we made. The lower plot shows the 5 volt rail power on transient, the output from our linear regulator, the OK felt net, and the 2.5 volt net. You can see that the most ideal portion of this curve, the power on glitch due to the comparator power on, and the resolution of this glitch. Yikes, pretty scary, right? I mean, there's only about 0.35 volts, only 350 millivolts between never turning on and turning on successfully. That doesn't feel like a lot, and maybe it's not, but we've got a spreadsheet that calculates margin analysis here. The analytical margin shows that the margin here is always 40% or more, but the whole comparator glitch thing never happens in ideal calculations. That said, the worst case stack up of component tolerance results in 60% margin with regard to the comparison. That's a good start. That's a fair bit of margin. I just hope it's enough. The glitch from the output comparators eats a lot of that margin, but you know, it'll probably work out. Uh huh. Making the 10 kilo ohm resistor a little larger or adding more capacitance to OK felt will provide even more margin while riding through the startup transient. Wow. It really is awesome how much of that margin we should have ends up getting eaten by that startup glitch on our two comparators. I mean, not like, haha, -ha, awesome, more like, oh crap, that matters, awesome. I guess this is a good lesson. When someone uses ideal components and strong assumptions when designing a circuit, the real waveforms might end up looking a little different than the perfectly ideal, wonderful version. Not always, but in this case, I wasn't terribly surprised to see this little glitch. I kind of expected my comparators this way, and that's why I designed my circuit with 60% margin instead of 10% margin. That's one of the startup conditions that we need to evaluate and ensure is always held true, but there's one more. Not only does 2.5 volts need to remain below OK felt, basically we have three voltages that need to chase after one another with margin. Sweet, sounds difficult. Let's do it and see what happens. The worst case for this threshold occurs when the 2.5 volt net charges as slowly as possible and the thresholds charge as fast as possible. In this case, we want to consider the strongest pull on the voltage threshold and compare the rate of charging there with the weakest possible pull on 2V5. This ends up looking like a 10K in resistor in parallel with a 2.49K resistor on the threshold side and then swinging our component tolerances to extremes for the 2.5 volts as well. Looking at the nominal simulation, this looks fine to me. Our strongest pull thresholds are chasing after one another nicely, where the margin is constantly increasing after t equals zero. No concerns here. This plot, in my opinion, is beautiful. As long as the margin is more than the combined effects of input offset voltage and input bias current, this shouldn't be an issue. The analytical methods we use to evaluate this transient matches the simulated waveform almost exactly. We can see the two nice sets of capacitor charging curves with a generally logarithmic form. 
Based on both the simulation and the analytical methods, this should probably work. But in very few cases, it seems like we might have a marginal startup condition on our hands. Yeah, cool. At extreme temperatures or very improbable stackups of component tolerances, we might have a little issue here. Why do I say that? Well, I'm shooting for more than 30% design margin because this design uses 20% tolerance capacitors. If my capacitors are all 20% weak on the RC filtered threshold, it may overtake the 2.5 volt threshold and shunt OK filter to ground, permanently disabling the printer forever. That'd be annoying. I guess the good news here is that the general form of Seth won't need to change to rectify this potential marginal startup condition for one of the temperature ranges. We're talking about changes that will change component values, not large design changes or changing the form of this thing. I'm pretty confident in the general form and the structure of the temperature monitor design. I'm also pretty confident in the component values that we've selected as a starting point. Like, I wouldn't choose components that I didn't think would work. That would be silly. You know as well as me, we've been sharing this journey together. We just walked through the theory of operation for this device in our last video. I wouldn't want to use the word bulletproof, but let's just say the circuit was designed in such a way that nuisance strips should be minimized, startups should consistently occur except for in very unlikely edge cases, but safety was not compromised. I'm really excited about that personally. I'm really excited to build this and see if our analysis, simulation, and measured results all agree. If they don't agree, I'm even more excited to learn why the measured circuit performance differs from my calculations and simulation. If the startup transient doesn't have enough margin to pull this design into the operational state, I think that would be very interesting. Maybe a little inconvenient, but very interesting. That reminds me, I've heard something about this before, uh, unfortunately I can't remember where, but I remember hearing an analogy involving circuit design and a stool, and I just want to share that with you. Circuit design is like a three-legged stool, where the three legs are analytical methods, simulation, and prototyping. When building a circuit like this temperature monitor, no matter how simple it might seem on the surface, it's still good practice to do the analysis, run the simulation, and build a prototype. That's why we did those things. We're trying to model good practice. If a system is truly simple, like if a system is so simple that you're tempted to skip some of those steps, just remember that simple systems don't take very long to analyze. And remember that skipping big design processes like simulation or calculations is like trying to build a stool with two legs. It might work out if the person sitting on that stool has a good sense of balance, but I prefer to sit on stools with three legs or more. Sitting on a stool with three legs makes it easier to succeed. Well, that's all we have for today, but if you like this video and can't wait for more, let me know by getting subscribed, hitting that like button, and leaving a comment down below. Coming up soon, we'll walk through how we did PCB layout to bring this design into reality and design a 3D printable enclosure for Seth. I can't wait. If you want to support the channel, consider checking out the products that we featured today through our Amazon affiliate links in the description. It really helps us out a lot. Thank you. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for watching EE for everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye!